Well, joining us now to get reaction to the Elizabeth Holmes verdict, Stanford Law Professor Robert Weisberg. And Professor, first, your reaction to this split decision? I don't think it's as split as some people may make it out. The case was always strongest for uh, fraud against the investors. They're the ones who were directly receiving uh, the messages from her. All the fraudulent statements were basically directed at their ears. They're the ones who most obviously and directly materially relied on those false statements because their response to the statements was to give them money. So in that sense, although a couple of the fraud uh, investor charges seem to have failed, the government really won the gist of the case. Indeed, the most important count was the first one, the, the conspiracy count, because that's really an umbrella that sort of subsumes the other fraud against investor counts. That sort of points to intent, right? The, the conspiracy, the intent was to defraud, and then the charge of, of you know, fraud, they did it. Right. The intent had to be there, but in particular, it has to be shown that there are people who received the message and directly relied on that message to their financial detriment. Mm -hmm. That was clearly established for the key investment claims here. It was always more difficult to establish that for the doctors and the patients, because if they rely on those messages, it's all rather, rather indirect. And the, the cost to them is more amorphous, uh, whereas in the case of the investors, the cost is perfectly straightforward, the money they gave her. Well, certainly this was tough for the jury. They had to get into the uh, 11 counts, certainly kind of get into the weeds regarding what Elizabeth Holmes had promised to investors and what she was thinking at the time. Yes, and it's uh, getting back to this question of intent. Uh, sure, uh, she avoided conviction on some counts, but remember one of her defenses or one of the themes of her defense was a kind of uh, uh, fecklessness. I didn't really understand what was going on. I was under the control of Mr. Balwani. I was naive and so on and so on. Uh, in that sense, because of the conviction on the key investor counts, the jury flatly rejected that. The jury made a really, uh, although you can parse the counts one at a time, a kind of holistic decision that this person knew exactly what she was doing, knew she was telling falsehoods, and continued to tell the falsehoods even after she faced criticism from her own people, like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the lab manager who was the first and crucial witness, uh, when they told her the device isn't working, the data is, is, is invalid, and she just plowed ahead. Now, her legal team, as you pointed out, did manage to convince the jury to clear her on four counts. Uh, does that play into her team's possible appeal on the convictions? No. Not at all. I mean, you know, they'll find things to appeal. I mean, normally appeals can't be simply on the basis that, gee, the jury got it wrong. You have to find very clear legal error that the judge committed, and I'm not sure if there is any. Uh, but uh, first of all, even if verdicts were inconsistent, juries are allowed to make inconsistent verdicts as long as the conviction counts are solidly based on the facts. But second of all, there's no inconsistency here. Uh, the counts on uh, defrauding investors were strong. The counts on defrauding doctors and patients and a few particular investors were not quite as strong. So we're not talking about any inconsistency or any illogic. Mm -hmm. It's just sensible differentiation by what, from what I can tell was a very sensible and methodical jury. Right, professor, thanks so much for the insight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right.